Alliance, and I'm so excited to welcome you here today. Um, we, we were just chatting um, uh, prior to opening the, the public room, and you guys are in for a treat today. So um, many of you, I recognize your, your names and faces, and you've, you've been with us. Um, so thank you for coming back. I see some new folks as well. So um, I'll take this opportunity to turn the floor over to our series host, Dr. Subramanian. Um, she's, a, she's a practicing movement disorder neurologist in um, Los Angeles and was kind of the impetus for us putting together um, this additional programming. Even though we are physically distanced, social connection is so important. So it has been amazing to, uh, to be on this journey with you, Dr. Subramanian. And those of you who have joined us, wait, we've had some great speakers, huh? Right? Okay, I see some nods and waves. So um, I'll go ahead and, uh, and turn it over to you, Dr. Subramanian, to introduce um, what we're gonna be, who we're gonna be talking today and kick us off. Okay, perfect. Um, welcome everyone. Hi from, you know, virtual distanced, uh, um, vir so virtually distanced but virtually connected land. Um, wanted to bring you some awesome people today. Um, Dr. Kempamel is a friend and a close colleague up the coast in sunny Santa Barbara. I'm not sure if it's raining up there, but we're, we're getting some rain down here in Southern California, which is kind of out of, out of the ordinary. So, um, so uh, Sarah will be doing this really cool interactive thing uh, where she's going to be um, bringing us a few surprise uh, curveballs today and we'll see how it all goes. Um, and uh, she will be also um, speaking to us with Abby, who's part of the PMD Alliance gang. So I'll tell you a little bit about Sarah. So Sarah is a board certified neurologist and she's fellowship trained from Stanford um, doing a movement source uh, specialty training there. She was at Harvard for med school and UC Irvine for internship and then UCSF for um, her neurology residency. And she really has a passion for supporting patients and um, caregivers and some of the same stuff that I've been interested in with integrative medicine and has been just a fabulous person to collaborate with over the years. And we share a lot of like-minded ideas when it comes to being passionate about patients. So um, Sarah will be working um, with Abby and I'll tell you a little bit about Abby as well. Abby um, is part of the PMD Alliance team and she, um, Abby Stone, uh, brings 25 years of experience in the fields of health education and gerontology to this team. Um, it's a really cool team. You guys have a lot of different members. So at some point, you'll just have to introduce us all to your whole team, but I don't know when we'll have time for that, but it seems like it's ever expanding and you're constantly finding new and amazing people to, um, you know, be advocates for Parkinson's patients. So, um, so Abby brings uh, compassion and enthusiasm to enhance the well-being of care partners and families living with movement disorders is really her her um, mission statement of herself. So, um, so yeah, with that, I'll hand it off to Sarah to teach us about um, some cool things with the mind-body connection. Thank you. Um, oh, and do I love getting to see you. Uh, can't, can't have enough time speaking <laughs> with you. And, um, and Abby, uh, who is my co-host today, was very gracious about uh, saying yes to, to doing this with me. So, what I'm going to do for our audience, I want to tell you a little bit about the format today. Um, I'm going to talk through a few slides just as some background. Then we're going to take a pause from slides and do something interactive. And then we'll do a few wrap-up slides. And then we have almost the rep, like really about half of our program today for um, discussion, seeing what resonated with people, seeing what questions people have. So um, I want you to feel welcome to uh, save those questions until about the second half of our, of our talk. Um, right now, what I'm gonna do is actually, I'm gonna go to a, a button where I'm gonna allow you guys to all see my desktop. And the reason I'm doing this is I'm gonna use this to share the PowerPoint today. So we're, we're all getting a new degree in Zoom here. Um, I'm gonna give a thumbs up from our host to make sure that is showing up okay uh, as the PowerPoint for today. Does that look okay? All right. And so what Abby and I wanted to focus on today is the idea of um, what can I do real time right now, even today, and even multiple times a day um, to talk to combat anxiety. Um, and when we started this, obviously working with the PMD Alliance, we were thinking about Parkinson's, um, the more the last few weeks have gone on, uh, we, we're telling friends and family and anybody about these, uh, these 
concepts because I think we're all in this together in terms of this being a, a much more anxious time um, really for, for the world and for most people, I would say. So um, thinking about anxiety, usually when I give a talk like this, I define it and I don't feel like I need to <laughs> right now. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and say that many of us, Parkinson's and those of us who don't have Parkinson's, um, have described sort of a mental and emotional exhaustion level um, recently. Um, this is, we're living through a new time in history and during our lifetimes, most of us haven't encountered anything like this. Um, more and more people with no history at all of mental health issues are now being affected due to things like unemployment, um, financial strain, fears about their health. Um, you can imagine that for a, a group of Parkinson's patients where the prevalence of things like anxiety or depression was already high because of the disease, um, they're now having new members to that group who maybe would have been doing fine mental health wise and then this kind of help just was the straw that broke the camel's back for some, some people. Um, uh, one fact I saw was interesting in CNN, um, there was a uh, there's a disaster distress helpline in the United States that's been around for a while and they saw an 891% increase in calls. Um, so these are free 1-800 calls for help at this time um, this year as compared to the same time last year in 2019. So let's see if I can make this long. So this is really the concept Abby and I want to have as our take home point. I want to keep things really non-clinical today. I want them to just be intuitive. Um, I want this to be something where whether you're watching it with as the patient, as your partner, as a, your daughter, whoever is watching, um, I wanted to think about us as animals and really getting back to the biology of why do we get anxious? So the way, the best way I have found uh, to discuss this with patients in clinic is to think about these two states that we live in as, as animals and, and to kind of remember we were never really designed to be, you know, commuting in traffic, racing to that job, going to a job interview, meeting with that boss. Um, we were really designed to be kind of foragers or resting or evading um, predators. You know, when you think about our, our uh, history, and, and so the image at the top, I, I'm sort of thinking of this beautiful gazelle resting and digesting. And I think a lot of us learned this concept when we were in school, um, but this is really called a parasympathetic state. So that means your parasympathetic nervous system is mostly taken over. It means that your body has shifted its focus from things like high metabolism and uh, needing to do highly active strenuous things to more of like a rebuild and heal kind of state. And then you see, um, I think any of us who have seen any kind of animal, animal interaction in the wild are familiar with the opposite, which is the fight or flight state. Now, this is really the, the, a different um, set point of the body where your sympathetic drive takes over. And now in this case, what you would see is someone's heart rate goes up, their blood pressure goes up, their eyes dilate, they're racing away from that predator, they're trying not to be eaten by the lion. Um, right now, in our case, we're feeling that way while we're sitting at home stuck on our couch. So you can imagine we're going to need some tools for what to do in this scenario. And that's what we wanted to demonstrate for you today. Um, I'm even going to take fight or flight quite literally to mean a demonstration with blood pressure and heart rate, as you'll see as soon as I hand things over to Abby. So I loved this uh, reporter from CNN named Darren Roval. Recently, he published an article where he was very open about sharing about his own history of what he called crippling anxiety. Um, I haven't seen a reporter do something like this to this degree. He really wanted to help other people during this time and feels that the world could be going or headed for a mental health crisis. And so I liked his description when you think about the fight or flight state we're talking about of that sympathetic overdrive. He wrote, my knees shook from the adrenaline running through my body nonstop. My muscles were exhausted from the tension. He later found out through lots of work on his own that the root of his anxiety came from a lack of control he had over his ultimate future. Right now, I don't know many people who can't relate to that sentiment. <laughs> um, he described that, what I like, I liked his description of, uh, Abby and I would call this kind of ruminating, destructive thoughts of negative thoughts circulating in our heads with no outlet causing negative outcomes in our brain and bodies. And this is really what prompted him to look at what we're gonna to do today called cognitive behavioral therapy, 
Um, and he really was desperate to what he said was rewire his brain. He was desperate for some tools. So what's so bad about being all revved up, right? Like that's just the gazelle that gets away from the, the tiger. That's the successful gazelle. Um, well, what's so bad about it in a modern society is we are not running away. We're not running four or five or six hours on the African tundra these days. Um, most of the time our revved up is actually in a sedentary position. We're sitting or we're even lying. Um, and so, you know, you can see this gentleman at work who's just getting completely pounded with all these assignments and expectations. You can see, I tried to pick an image of a young man on the right who's just com in complete distress watching the news and looks pretty depressed. And um, the thing about all three of these pictures is all three of these animals are probably in a sympathetic drive kind of state, like their heart's pounding, their blood pressure's high, they're sweating, their, their body is it ready to fight or flight. But in our current situation, they, we, we don't have the option of flight. So what do we do? It turns out that um, more and more research, even before coronavirus came, was suggesting that prolonged periods of sympathetic surge, like this kind of fight or flight state or ruminating can actually be pretty destructive to our health and our biology. Um, we, we found it may increase the risk of other things like hypertension, maybe possibly cancer. And I think personally adding insult to injury currently is that it actually can impair our immune system's ability to fight off infections. So if you take a deep breath now and think about all the reasons that there are to learn how to train our bodies to get out of this sympathetic fight or flight state, one of the biggest motivators for you might actually be to have your immune system at its top performance right now. Uh, in medicine, before again, before this current pandemic, we would say when to treat anxiety is when it involved excessive, it was excessive, uh, people were avoiding desired social activities, it was interfering with the ability to function during the day, impacting appetite, weight gain, weight loss, or disrupting sleep. Um, I always try and highlight the latter, the final two, because those are really important in Parkinson's. As people know, appetite's important for keeping on muscle mass, and as people um, have often shared with me, a good night's sleep can make the difference between good motor function or poor motor function the next day in Parkinson's. So going into treatment options for anxiety is going to be beyond the scope of this discussion. Um, other than that, I'm happy to answer questions at the end when we get to it. Um, I, I am a very aggressive to treat this, again, before all of this last few months happened even, because I think it's a huge issue for quality of life. Um, some of the staples in Parkinson's are SSRIs, SNRIs. I'm not going to say a lot about benzodiazepines. Those are things like Ativan, Lorazepam. Um, they, are, they definitely help anxiety and curb anxiety in a short sense. But we're trying today to look for something that's a good long-term solution, something you can even do multiple times a day if you needed to. And it would not be safe to do that with those. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Um, I once heard the... Um, the head of the US, he gave a talk, uh, the gentleman who comes up with the exercise parameters for the country. And he said, um, if, you're feeling, if you're feeling down, go for a walk. If you come back and you're still feeling down, it wasn't a long enough walk. Um, I think there's a huge amount here. And I think well, part of our discussion today is how we can support people getting exercise in the current setting of um, limiting socialization. Uh, looking at the timing of Parkinson's meds, it, it is important right now to still keep paying attention to if anxiety is getting worse a particular time of day or when a certain med dose wears off. And then these last two are really, excuse me, the last two are really what we're going to do with Abby right now. So we're going to talk about cognitive behavioral therapy and we're going to do some demonstrations of a relaxation and breathing technique um, with meditation. So if you're not familiar with this, it can sound a little bit um, like it like you, it can sound a little new age perhaps. Um, and so what Abby and I wanna do is really explain the biological basis for this and make sure people understand what exactly is this doing for anxiety sy symptoms and who could benefit. Um, I think one thing with anxiety that's actually been very interesting to hear conversations about right now is anxiety really creates a shallow breathing in us. And then we, when we breathe more shallowly, it turns out it actually triggers more anxiety in our brains. And then you can imagine this is a vicious cycle. It's been especially problematic lately because shortness of breath is one of the features that um, doctors are encouraging patients to present for treatment or testing in the era of COVID. And so I think understanding the relationship with anxiety and shortness of breath is almost more important than ever right now. 
the idea with cognitive behavioral therapy that we're going to try is something that could potentially break this cycle. So I'm going to um, talk slowly as I welcome my friend and colleague Abby Stone here. I'm going to um, go ahead and the reason I'm talking slowly is I'm setting up an EKG monitor. I'm going to get off my screen sharing here. I'm going to go back to, are we back on the presenters mode? Let's see. Yes, you are. Yeah, do I have everyone back as we should? Okay. And I'm, as I'm hooking myself up here, I'm going to um, show you guys what I'm doing with this monitor. This is the same, this is a telemetry, telemetry monitor like the one you get at the hospital. So if you go into the emergency room, this is what they hook you up to. Um, I'm going to take off my jacket and put on a blood pressure cuff. I think I have, I'm pretty sure I have everything hooked up otherwise, but you guys will find out in a second. So you can see my leads here going in under my shirt to my EKG leads here. Um, this is the blood pressure cuff that's going to allow us to monitor blood pressure. And I have never done this before ever, and I have never done something like this publicly. So this will be an interesting experiment, but I am, it is so critical for us to understand the relationship between fight or flight and rest and digest that I'm willing to make a total fool of myself. So here we go. <laughs> I'm gonna put this on a, a manual that allows me to check blood pressure very regularly. I think we're good to go here. I'm gonna hit home. So what I want to show you guys, because in a minute I'm going to mute myself. Let's make sure you have a good angle with the lights here. I'm going to mute myself. I don't need you to see my face for this next part, but I'm going to be a participant with Abby. And you can see why I'm going to mute myself because it's very loud. But this number up here is my heart rate. I'm a little nervous right now. <laughs> um, I'm mostly nervous I won't get the machine to work. All right. This down here is my respiratory rate. That's how, how quickly I'm breathing. Again, you can see I'm a little nervous. This, this number down here, I don't really expect that to change. That's my SpO2. That means how much blood oxygen my blood is getting right now. So unless the air in this room changes in the next few minutes, I don't expect to have that change. Um, and I think that's all I need you to know. So respiratory rate, heart rate, this this one right here that keeps trying is a blood pressure, and that's another important one to see. That's, that's all we're gonna talk about today. Let me silence this just for a second. What I wanna say about Abby's part here is if you've never done an exercise like this before of mindfulness or breathing, I want you to approach it as just somebody who's making a new discovery for themselves. So like you're discovering a new island where um, humans have never set foot. And so your, your mind is going to get noisy. You're going to have judgments. You're going to have judgments about that island. You're going to be looking for other people there. You're going to say it's beautiful. It's not. But whatever that is, just let, allow yourself to, I'm going to silence myself again, allow yourself to move past those. And just for the next few moments, just be doing this experiment along with us. So for obvious reasons, I'm going to mute myself now. <laughs> Please take it away. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks so much. So um, first, welcome all of you, and, um, and thank you for uh, being here today with us. Um, I'm going to give you a, a brief definition of uh, meditation, and then um, a little overview, and then lead you through a short, about five-minute um, guided meditation. So meditation allows for you to become more familiar with your actual experience moment to moment without judgment. This classic meditation is designed to deepen your sense of concentration. Consider um, for a moment how preoccupied, and particularly in these times, um, and deep in our thoughts we may ordinarily be. You can see how harnessing our thoughts and gathering our attention can be of great benefit to our well-being, as Sarah mentioned. Um, imagine having an experience of reclaiming all that energy, which is always available to us, yet we're not often aware of because we're directing our thoughts into the future or into the past or looking at how we might have done things differently, that ruminating that Sarah also mentioned. 
And we can gather all of that attention and become aware and focused and have a sense of ease. We can do this by using a simple object, an ordinary object, like the feeling of our breath. As it, as it is alone, it has great potential of really bringing us a sense of wholeness and a sense of calmness. So we're about to do a five minute breathing meditation and there'll be several pauses through this guided meditation. So if you're anything like me, when I'm doing my um, daily sitting or, or my meditation, often what my mind does during that pause is, uh-oh, did I just lose audio? Is it over? Did I miss something? Did my phone stop working? So I'm just letting you know ahead of time, there'll be a few pauses. We're not going anywhere. We'll be right back. <laughs> So to begin with, you can sit or lie down comfortably, relaxed yet alert. You don't have to feel self-conscious as though you're about to do something special or weird. Just be at ease. It helps if you can um, sit with your back straight without being strained or overarched. You can close your eyes or not however you feel comfortable. You want to notice where the feeling of the breath is most predominant for you. It may be at the nostrils, at the chest, or at the abdomen. Bring your attention there and let it rest in just that area. See if you can feel just one breath from the beginning through the middle to the end. If you're with the breath at the nostrils, you may feel tingling, vibration, warmth, or coolness. If at the chest or abdomen, you may feel movement, pressure, stretching, and a release. If you're having difficulty uh, feeling those sensations and you're at the chest or abdomen, you can place your palm of your hand on your abdomen or your chest and you can actually feel the rise and lowering of your breath. You don't have to name these sensations, just feel them. It's just one breath. If images, sounds, emotions, or sensations arise, and they aren't strong enough to actually take you away from the feeling of your breath, just let them flow by. You don't have to follow after them. You don't have to resist them. You're breathing. Just keep coming back to the feeling of the breath. It's like seeing a friend in a crowd. You don't have to shove everyone away, aside, make them go away. It's your enthusiasm. It's your interest that's going towards that friend. Well, there's my friend, there's the breath. If something arises, sensations, emotions, thoughts, whatever it might be that is strong enough to take your attention away from the breath, if you fall asleep or you get lost in some incredible fantasy, see if you can let go and begin again, bringing your attention back to the breath.
If you have to let go and begin again a thousand times, it's fine. That is the practice. It's just one breath. You may notice that the rhythm of your breath has changed during the course of this meditation se session. You can just allow it to be however it is. That is fine. If you see your attention jumping to the past, jumping to the future, having judgment, speculation, that too is fine. Our practice is to gently let go and simply return to the breath. You can gently bring your attention back to the feeling of the breath, remembering that letting go of whatever carried you away, the important word is gentle. We can gently let go. We can forgive ourselves for having wandered. And with great kindness to ourselves, we can return to the breath and begin again. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes. So sometimes we feel energized and exhilarated after this kind of practice and sometimes calm and rested and sometimes too rested. That too is normal. And what I'm gonna do is um, we're gonna check in with Sarah to see, see if your, your heart rate got lowered any. <laughs> oh my goodness. I had a little bit of a hard time coming back there. Can you guys hear me okay? Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Right. Um, I, whew, I'm, I'm excited to hear what um, people are going to share with us in a moment. I, I uh, thank you, Abby. I had a hard time coming back. <laughs> um, so yeah. I, I have um, a little yeah. bit of um, some hints <laughs> that may be helpful. Um, first, you know, we can use breathing meditation any time throughout the day. And it has great potential for um, being present in the moment on purpose, which is really the foundation of mindfulness meditation. Um, it's where you get to observe your thoughts and feelings without judging them or yourself. So here we aren't trying not to have thoughts. We're just using our breath as an anchor for awareness without judgment. And I think that's, that's the biggest takeaway here is that awareness without judgment of just letting things be, including yourself. So back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Abby. Oh, who wants to have Abby come home with them right now? My God. Okay. I'm going to try and pull myself together to do a few more slides and then I, I'm going to have to hand it over. I'm too relaxed. Um, I just wanted to mention that I don't, we'll talk about it in a second, but I noticed my blood pressure dropped pretty dramatically. My heart rate dropped pretty dramatically from where I started. So that's kind of what we want to focus on in, in thinking about this as a real therapy with real merit and um, actual biological basis. Um, probably one of the best things we can do for our overall health and well being right now and not needing anyone's help um, to be able to enact any of what we just did. So let's talk about how we can do that. Um, I'm going to go to my shared slides again here. Okay, I'm going to open up this and I'm going to bring you back to the finish our PowerPoint. 
uh, and someone speak up if we if I have anything that's not showing up here. So cognitive behavioral therapy is what we just did. We did some mindfulness breathing therapy. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is usually done with a an MFT uh, marriage family therapist or someone with specialized training to work through uh, changing neural pathways. And, and we're going to talk about what we could do now in the meantime before we can discover someone like that in our lives. Um, I just wanted to point this out. There's a time, it's a time when many of us feel like things are spinning out of control. Um, and as we said, this is something you have control over where, when you do it, where you do it in your space, how often you use, you do it. Um, this is safe to do multiple times a day. Unlike taking something like an Ativan or a Lorazepam, um, it has no side effects. So, um, Doctor, it, it, the physicians who are on this call with me today would say, you know, wow, show me a drug that I can say that about. That's that's pretty special. <laughs> um, this isn't also just something Abby and I are making up today. So some recent press includes um, in the one of our journals that we read as neurologists called Neurology. Um, there was a re release about a year ago now that mindfulness yoga reduced stress and motor symptoms in patients with Parkinson's. I want to highlight that it's not just the the stress part. Um, there's the motor part too. Mindfulness yoga actually had an impact on people's motor abilities. Some other press for those of us who are tuning in today and maybe don't have a diagnosis of Parkinson's. It turns out this is good for all of us. So here's some research um, through the NIH that's still uh, kind of being reviewed, but mindfulness practice in these two groups actually changed the structure of our brains. So in one study, it increased the regional gray, gray matter density. Another study, um, it actually increased cortical thickness. So we don't absolutely know how to interpret those changes, but that's pretty powerful when we say that, that we have the ability to change neural networks in the brain. This is what neurologists are trying to say. Um, so how can I do more of this? Um, well, ideally, we'd all have an Abby in our life. <laughs> we'd, we'd all have someone we can work with to, to work on these practices and to get them as part of our routine. Um, some of the, there are some things you can do even today to find a coach that's a digital coach. And that means you can go to things like, and, and I'd love uh, Dr. Samaranian at the end to, to, to chime in here too. Um, but listening apps where you can put them on your phone or your computer one of them is called Insight Timer. That has uh, providers from all over the world who do sessions that are as short as five minutes and as long as an hour and a half. Um, one of them is Headspace. Um, that's another similar idea. Uh, there are many more. Um, Abby and I actually both really like Insight Timer because the speakers are from all over the world, accents and styles from all over the world. Um, so you, it would be very hard not to find a single person whose style you like um, because you have such a huge array of options. And again, these are all free. Um, I guess everybody is doing this now. Uh, my Apple alert on my phone said I can download free meditation with P. Diddy. So for those of you who don't know who this is, this is a rapper from the 90s. So, um, you know, I guess it's very cool these days to be looking at this. <laughs> Um, and I just want to again highlight that th this, don't forget the power of exercise in getting you to this relaxed parasympathetic state. So exercise is giving your body an opportunity to use up all those fight or flight chemicals and home ho hormones that are floating around our bodies and, and it really gives us the opportunity to return to that more parasympathetic resting tone. Um, I just love this image of this professional athlete after she's finished a race. Um, can you just imagine, like, she's had all the sympathetic juices of her body completely used up to do this performance, and she just looks like she's in this state of complete rest and peace. Mm -hmm. And remember that all these things we're talking about today that are good for anxiety are also good for your immune system. And right now, we're all trying to help prevent infections for ourselves and those we love. So sleeping, eating healthy food, trying not to drink too much. This one's been hard for my family when we're home with little kids every day. Um, exercising and finding something that we're gonna talk about now that really, one of, one of these opportunities for mindfulness breathing um, that really works for you, that curbs your anxiety and practicing it regularly as often as you need to. Um, I wanted to just highlight two more ideas before we open it up for conversation. Um, there was a beautiful piece in the BBC um, about a month ago now, 
and it was called, if you want to just Google this on your own sometime, An Astronaut's, An Astronaut's Guide to Surviving Isolation. Um, and what I loved about it is they interviewed astronauts who spend a year or so in space and said, gosh, what do you do in this situation? And it was just really beautiful, the guidance they gave. It was a really um, amazing piece and a nice, nice reminder that this is a topic some have faced before. Finally, um, with some contribution from family and friends, instead of the news cycle, I, um, one of the biggest things I wish I could prescribe to people is turning off the news um, or even just at least please after 11, 7, 8, 7 p.m. for instance, like when it's time to have your body wind down, get ready for bed. Um, it, it's, we don't get to do the same things we're used to doing for recreation, but there's a lot we can do. So uh, some of the fun ones I've heard recently are buy a board game that you loved as a kid and start playing it again. Um, sitting Tai Chi has been a really nice um, combination of exercise and mindfulness. Um, researching your ancestry, all that, all that, all those facts you wanted to search about your family, this is the perfect time to do that. Um, doing things like coffee dates virtually with friends. Um, this one is one my family's been trying where you write and send a letter to every family member. So you include cousins, children, grandchildren. Uh, so my seven-year-old's been doing that and sending a handwritten seven-year-old letter to grandmas and grandpas has been pretty special and, and great grandmas and great grandpas. Um, Organize photos that like all those photos sitting in your closet where you think, oh, I wish I could give those to the kids or watch all those family home videos you've saved. Um, another one I really love seeing is there's got to be something you've always wanted to learn more about. So go to like PBS or BBC, National Geographic and, and order a series on that thing you always wanted to learn about or be an expert on. Uh, try the recipe that takes 10 attempts before you get it right. Um, and maybe pick a child in your life who's learning to read, whether they're nearby or far away, and either read to them on their phone or have them read to you and do 20 minutes now and then. I think that it's really important to remember that while social isolation can be bad for anxiety, negative relationships and ruminating thoughts, as Abby and I tried to hone, hone in on today, can as well. And so as you take a step back, in fact, even do this with today's session, today's lunch hour, I want you guys to take a step back when you hang up with us and say, I wanna make sure what I was just doing online improved my anxiety. Because lots of what we are doing online might not be serving your mental health or well-being, and may need to be a little more limited. So things like nonstop news cycles, social commentary about politics, Facebook, on and on and on. Um, in some cases, the best thing you can do may be to take a break from some of the social online groups if the conversations make you more anxious or nervous. And if you're worried you'll miss important breaking news, you can always ask a loved one and say, you're gonna be my point person. I want you to call me if anything develops that I need to do something right away in response to, if there's any emergency health-wise that I need to change my, my actions today. Um, if you're feeling nervous about how to excuse yourself from online group conversations that are turning out to be unhealthy for you, you can just politely say, for my own mental health, I'm going to try disconnecting from the online world for a little while and spend more time reading or outdoors or muse with music. And honestly, I think not only do most people understand this, this choice right now, but it may actually allow them to see something for themselves as well. So Abby and I did want to leave people with a slide. Um, support if what you need for debilitating anxiety goes beyond this very, very superficial skim off the top. Um, some families are dealing with real emergencies in terms of anxiety at home. Um, I'd start with asking your primary care doctor or neurologist for a referral. Many mental health providers are able to work with people over the computer. In fact, this was one of the original fields that telemedicine got started in even before the era of COVID. Um, I've included the Disaster Distress Helpline here. It's a 1-800 number. Um, you can speak directly with a trained counselor anytime, night or day, any day of the week, and it's for free. It was originally developed for anyone experiencing distress or mental health concerns related to any human or national disaster. Finally, there's some information about the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, the American Psychiatric Association, and some people are having great luck in finding meditation or mindfulness groups that do live streams together. So I'm happy to provide this slide um, to the PMD Alliance if people have questions for themselves or their family. So I think with that, I'm gonna wrap up the talking portion of today. And Abby and I are really just here for, um, I'm gonna 
undo my screen share now and um, join, rejoin, rejoin the world. And uh, Abby and I are here for the remainder of the time to just hear impressions, hear what people's uh, thoughts were about um, doing that exercise led by Abby and what we learned today about the biological basis for how some of this can increase our parasympathetic rest and digest tone and help hopefully move us away from a fight or flight sympathetic lion chasing me state of mind. That's great. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. It was amazing. So one question was, what did your heart rate show? Did you, was it not visible on there? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, I started, I looked at it. I took a glance. Uh, I started at, maybe I should have left the beeping on, but I thought it would be really rude to Abby. My heart rate was going like beep, 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 because I, um, this, machine infuriates me. I've had to get three different cords for it today and plug it into a battery. And anyway, you can see all the all the technical stuff going on there. So I started out very annoyed and upset by the machine. Um, and I, I actually think my heart rate looked like it was over 100 because I was pretty... It was like, it was like 110 at the beginning. So Yeah, we're... and I usually have a pretty low heart rate, so that's high for me. So it was a perfect time to do this demonstration because I tried to look away from the computer um, I stayed hooked up, but I tried to kind of just listen to Abby's voice. Um, and I think it dropped down in the 60s, I believe. Wow, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody saw that better than me, feel free to chime in. But So I wanted to ask you, Sarah, because um, you're unique and not just so you're such an amazing neurologist, but you have, you know, a, a family life that's a bit interesting at the moment. So maybe mm -hmm. we can talk, well, let's just take a couple minutes to find out why you went into neurology and why Parkinson's, and then also tell us about your current family life and why this sort of practice oh. makes a lot of sense for you right now. Yeah, you're so sweet to be checking in on me, uh, Indu. Um, yeah, I went into neurology because I just loved, uh, I loved watching how um, repeated experiences reinforce different connections in our brain. Like the more you uh, experience something, I just loved the idea that the brain was made up of connections among neurons and that those trenches would get dug deeper and deeper and deeper. And it just made sense to me that that is why we become who we become. Um, and I originally went into movement disorders. I was uh, at, I think it was at UCSF when um, I was in clinic and someone who had deep brain stimulation came into clinic whose battery had died and their tremor was really pretty pronounced. And um, the doctor put an interrogator on their chest and clicked a button or two and said, oh, you poor thing. Some, you, something got at the airport. You looks like you got turned off. Here, let me fix that. And pushed one button. And this gentleman's tremor went from that to just resolving. And those of us who work in movement disorders see that a lot. Now it's actually, we're almost jaded to that effect for people with tremor. But um, I remember going home that night and being like, I have never seen anything like that in neurology ever, ever, ever how can I go into that field? So that was how I originally got interested in Parkinson's. Yeah. And I about your home life. what I was supposed to say, because I'll keep rambling about that. What was that? Your home life right oh, now. Home life. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, Indu tried to call me this morning. I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old, and I think I caught like two words from what you said, Indu, and I think I yelled something like, I'll get that to you right away. But, um, so we have young children at home, and then my husband is uh, here in Santa Barbara is a critical care um, and an ICU doctor. So um, he is running uh, our region's COVID response and doing a lot of the protocols for our region, but it turns out the hospitals up and down the coast of California are all really trying to help each other. So he's actually been involved with um, facilitating that process for lots of different hospitals. Um, and so for us, it's meant, um, I think, I, I mean, pertinent to the exercises we're doing today, for us, it's meant living with the uncertainty and probably I would say expectation of being COVID positive at our house. Um, so my husband is putting intubation tubes down people's throats and any, sometimes they have to trick people like um, putting in a breathing line here. And so that's been, I think my struggle with um, anxiety and just thinking through this time has been um, different than some because it's not so much about preventing infection at my house. Um, it's more about keeping others around us safe and the fears anyone would have about, you know, the people they care about getting sick. So that's been, um, yeah, did I answer your question? Did I answer your question? Okay. Yeah, you speak from a place of really, you know, living this every day with the high stress, high anxiety, and then using these practices on a day-to-day -day basis, which I know that they've yeah. let you be able to find balance in your own life. And I think many of us are feeling exactly that 
mental exhaustion, the sort yeah. of emotional exhaustion, and people talk about being in this sort of um, heightened anxious state 24 yeah. and, and this has gone on for six weeks already or more and so yeah. and without a clear end in sight so I think these practices are absolutely important so other messages that have come through so somebody really liked Abby's guided med med meditation delivery it was the best she's ever heard this is from Sheila just the right balance of tone cadence um, well-meaning meditation coaches sometimes um, overdo it from my attention span, speaking so overly soft and gentle that it's distracting or comes across as condescending. So yes, good, good meditation there. Um, Abby, some, can I ask, Andrew, can I ask Abby a quick question? Abby, what would you, if people don't get to have an Abby at home with them, because I'm very jealous your family gets to have an Abby at home with them, um, tell me, tell the, our group about your favorite researchers or where you'd start if this was all new to you today, like if this was the first time you've ever tried any of this. So this is the first time I've led virtually like this. I've led one-on-one -on -one or in a group. Um, and um, my favorite, again, is Insight Timer. Although um, in response to the current circumstances that we're all living in, John Kabat-Zinn, who is the founder of the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program, um, has daily Zoom programs. Um, and it's Wisdom 202. If you go on YouTube and just Google John Kabat-Zinn, um, every day he has um, a, either a group meditation or a talk. Mm -hmm. um, there are podcasts that are every, I, I walk every day and honestly, this is so telling, you know, I like the podcast that are like an hour and a half because then I've gotten 90 minutes of exercise in. Um, Joseph Goldstein is one of my favorites. Um, it's the Be Here Now Network. Um, very incredible. Um, sometimes a little out of my comfort zone, a little too um, Sanskrit, um, using words right. that I can't exactly relate to. But the John Kabat-Zinn, um, every day on YouTube, um, very reasonable, um, very um, easy to digest and follow. So those are my favorite, and I do sit every day um, sometimes it's 40 minutes, sometimes it's three. Um, I did see someone's question about what happens. Um, I, I, you know, I get bored, meditation is bored. Sometimes it is for me too. And if you would speak to any great meditation teacher, they would say the same thing. So my advice would be to sit again, <laughs> it, to just do it again. And realizing that you're bored, you're getting the meditation done because you're aware from moment to moment that boredom comes in. It's life. So thank you. I hope that answer gave people some resources. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, that is part of the whole process is realizing that this isn't easy. And um, I ended up doing the mindfulness-based stress reduction course at the VA with one of our first um, guests here, um, Greg Serpa, who works at, with Insight LA. And so much of what we did when we paired up in groups, so you basically have a partner every week and you discuss how your meditations went. And I think that it made it so much easier in some ways to go through the eight weeks because all we talked about was how hard it was and how hard it was to find the time and how hard it was to not, you know, get antsy or, or restless or, you know, bored or whatever. And to, you know, stay on that kind of like exercise. Sometimes the more you do it, the more you kind of get get hooked so that is part of it so stick with it that's the whole point is to feel bored and feel those thoughts and realize that you're restless and and that is just the whole practice that is sort of just being being in your own mind and and understanding what's going on in there and and once you realize that then you realize that this is just the human condition so um so let's see what other questions so um john johnny had a question yeah about the the boring part of it um, the meditation being boring, but then he said he does pray the rosary, can that count? And absolutely, I think most of us would think that that would count. There's many ways to meditate, and sometimes it's the mindfulness practices like we just did today. Sometimes it's even being in nature, being out for a walk even. Sometimes you can get meditative. Swimming can be meditative. So, so it's not just... Um, 
you know, having to sit in a place and, and do these exact things. And I think there's very many paths to, you know, some of these. And I think a lot of the resources that you put up there are going to give you a lot of different options of what to try. So the, the sort of motivation to just get on there and, and search around and you might not find the right voice and you have to find the right teacher and, you know, what might be my favorite might not be, you know, you're all favorite, but, you know, I think just like anything else, give it, give Keep searching and there's lots if of free resources out there. Sorry, Andy, if I can add to that too, um, I think the meditation part is losing, is missing the point. So I think it's fine if you're bored by this, like, and if praying is a way for you to have um, mindful time where you're reflecting, deep breathing, and where if you were to check your blood pressure and your heart rate, it turns out you're in a very parasympathetic state. Well, then you already have the tool, a tool that works for you. Another way of thinking about that would be um, like listening to music for me. I don't always need someone coaching me with a voice. Like if I pick like that type of music that just really just feeds my soul, I bet if I were to wear this heart rate, blood pressure, which now I'm laughing because no one could see it, I guess, but I'm betting if I were to wear that and um, during my listening to music, if it were uninterrupted, quiet time on my own, deep breathing, stomach breathing, trying to kind of think about what Abby had taught, um, I would probably, I could achieve some similar gain for myself in terms of, again, just shifting this fight or flight, um, sympathetic overdrive state to more of a parasympathetic tone, so. And I think too, to add to that, um, that the meditation, as I said in the beginning, um, allows for us to become more familiar with our actual experience moment to moment. Mm -hmm. So that boredom is something that comes up mm -hmm. all the time in life. It, it's fine it, you know, to include that. I think when we're pushing um, boredom, anxiety um, away or resisting it, it just gets bigger. Uh, John kabat is the son-in-law of Howard Zinn. I'm not sure I know who Howard Zinn is, but I love John kabat -Zinn. Who's Howard Zinn? Does anyone know? Yeah. Sheila, maybe you can type in who Howard Zinn is. Um, I, there's, there's just also a few comments about apathy and trying to get an apathetic person or a patient, I guess if it's the caregiver, um, to try some of these um, practices. Um, do you guys have any advice on that? I mean, I think... This is an interesting time to look at those kinds of behaviors for ourselves and, and say you've never had the stakes be higher for yourself. So what I'm trying to say there is like, there's never been a the stakes higher kind of time for, for instance, wanting your immune system to be healthy. And so maybe just saying like, look, this current situation is an opportunity for me to learn this um, because I, I'm actually trying to support my immune system or um, I can't get in to see a doctor right now and my anxiety has been out of control and with such and such assistant or uh, uh, guidance over the tele telemedicine prompt or whatever it is, I just think that um, we used to talk a lot about exercise, exercise, exercise is your, and I don't think that's been replaced with this, but I don't think it's this is any less important just with what our bodies and minds and hearts are going through right now. And so I would never be so bold as to tell a patient, you should absolutely be a swimmer for exercise. That's the only thing that was going to work. I think that's the only thing good for your Parkinson's in your heart. Um, similarly, I would, I would never be so bold as to say, you've absolutely got to buy my DVD and, and CD of, of, you know, meditation, mindful practices, and it's the only one that's going to work for you. But I would be bold enough to keep um, I would be bold enough to keep encouraging the people I love to keep searching till they find whatever, whichever one it is or form that resonates with them. Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. it also, I think it also, I'm sorry, I can ramble on this forever. I apologize. One more thing. Um, we skimmed over the slide about medical treatment for anxiety. So things like SSRIs, SNRIs, um, as before all of this began as a provider, my population of patients would tell you I'm probably more aggressive that, uh, at starting people on an SSRI for anxiety or depression than I am at starting them on levodopa for the first time for their Parkinson's. And I see a couple of familiar faces um, on this screen that are smiling and nodding a look of, uh, a look of uh, yes, that's the case. I remember these conversations with you, Dr. Kentmel. 
Um, I, I think if, if everything you're trying is not allowing you to, to be able, if you're not able to function within whatever the limitations of our day-to-day -day is right now, it is a really good time to pick up the phone and say, hey doc, I know you've been talking to me about an SSRI for anxiety for years. I've been doing mindfulness, I've been exercising. I, I, I have a feeling that this current worldwide threat was just enough to push, push me over a little bit. And um, I, I guess I'd be okay with trying that for six months or you know, let, let's give that a try. I'm ready to say yes to that right now. Again, not with the idea of pressuring you to be on another drug, but really right now I'm saying try everything, do everything that can support that shift in sympathetic fight or flight like lion chasing you tone to more of the parasympathetic. So, sorry, do I interrupted you? Excuse no, no, me. that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an it's sort of a multi prong approach. I think if you can try to do lifestyle measures with trying to get um, exercise in, trying to get the mindfulness in, trying to get good sleep, trying to eat right, trying to prevent yourself from being in this barrage of social um, media and hype, hyping a lot of energy up um, and and stress up by being in this constant um, kind of pattern of, of nonstop information. I know some people have uh, the news on 24 seven and I think just disconnecting from that, perhaps getting into nature or trying to get a break is, is definitely all, all for sure important. And then, you know, also communicating with your physicians about your own mental health right now. I think many people are at risk, both our patients and our caregivers. And even as healthcare providers, I think we're all feeling very, very, stressed out um, in general as a society. So I think we just have to be, be honest and communicate with each other. And, and certainly if you're feeling like you're not in control of the situation and that it's really dire, then reach out. I think Sarah put up some, some um, resources and those are there for you so that you don't harm yourself or someone else or let it get out of control. So um, yeah, so what's an SSRI? Somebody asked, so they were just saying, and then Judy wrote, PD treatment is truly as much an art as a science. And I think you and I would both agree we're, we're constantly uh, balancing those things and it probably attracts people that are, are both um, scientists and artists at the same time. So um, Sarah, I just wanted to give you and um, Abby a minute each maybe to wrap up with something inspirational. It's at 12.58 right now and then we'll have our goodbye wave. Uh, I'll go first because everyone should be left with Abby's voice resonating in their ears today. So my quick goodbye is um, I think there is, it's an opportunity right now to, to look at what we could do in terms of different habits in our day. And if there's anything we can do to support each other with finding out what it is that makes your life sing, even when there are circumstances so far beyond our control, um, please take care of each other and support each other and, and keep trying to make that available to one another. So, and I'll hand it to Abby. Thank you, thanks. So to all of you, um, may you be happy, may you be safe, may you be healthy, and may your days be filled with ease. And um, this has been such an honor and privilege. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Peg wrote something here. Just I'll read it maybe just as a close. As a veteran of PD for 24 years, meditation has helped significantly. It started with TM, which is transcendental meditation. Now practice mindfulness with deep breathing. Um, I have moderate to severe dyskinesia and use meditation. Um, do you have any other suggestions to manage and decrease the number and severity of dyskinesia? Thank you. I would talk to your doctor about that. There are some medications that one can try and certainly all of these strategies. So the meditation is probably the most powerful, but exercise can also help. In, in and, my Indu, I'll just add to that. Um, I've had a patient who was so dyskinetic that he or she could not stay on the chair during clinic. And um, after going to a talk like this that said, see one, do one, teach one for providers, I just said, okay, you know, let's do it. So we, I did an exercise with them not knowing what I was doing. Um, and we were able to finish our session together that day just by having some deep breathing together at the start of the conversation. And so I'm increasingly aware of the power of doing it with my patients and with one another to, to try these out together. They don't need to be a solo activity, so. No, I think it's a good add one more thing. Um, yeah. The breath is portable. You can do it anywhere at any time. And I will make available my, uh, the script um, so that it can be on our website. Yeah, thank you. 
That's lovely. Well, thank you so much, ladies. I am a big believer in mindfulness. And uh, I think week one, we had our mind, my mindfulness teacher on. So totally a believer in that. And um, it is the breath. Um, and these practices will always be with us, even, you know, into end of life issues. It's pretty magical how, how transportable this is. And uh, so um, I thank you again for joining us and um, hope that everyone can continue to try to try these practices, keep trying. It's not easy. It's not something that you're going to sit down and it's going to be, you know, something that's going to come with ease, just like anything else. It, it takes practice and persistence. So um, thanks for joining us. And thank you, PMD Alliance, for hosting this type of program. And um, I will hand it back to you guys. Yes, so, thank you. Is. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Abby and Dr. Kemel and Indu. Oh, I feel, I feel great. I want to start <laughs> hooking myself up to my Apple watch and just doing stuff like all the things you shared, uh, listening to music or what have you. So, um, what a, a fun way to, to kind of see it in action. So thanks so much again for joining us. Um, we'll be back on Friday. We're going to be, um, Indu's going to be interviewing, um, Dr. Tagliati, um, from Cedars sinai and, uh, um, everything that I hear, it's going to be hard to smush it all into an hour to hear about his research and, um, and the two of them are a, are a hoot when they chat. So please join us Friday at noon. And until then, try some meditation, try some breathing, and uh, can't wait to see you guys back soon. Bye now. Bye.